Hi, everyone, and welcome to this F-Track webinar, Animation After a Pandemic. I'm Ian Fales. I'm a visual effects journalist and editor of beforesandafters.com, joining you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, we've got a great bunch of panelists today um, from uh, Europe, the UK, uh, not from Australia. Um, and it's really great of you to join us. You know, COVID-19's impact on the world has been profound. It has affected the lives of many from trivial concerns through to far deeper and more extensive changes to the way we live our daily lives. One of the most widely experienced changes is working from home, of course, with millions heading to home offices, bedrooms, kitchen tables, cafes, or whatever space they can find to carry out responsibilities away from the office desk. And there are both positives and negatives to working from home, whether it's benefiting from the extra time gained from the lack of a commute, or finding it difficult to perform effectively when away from the direct face-to-face -face collaboration of an office environment. Today, in this uh, webinar, we'll examine those positives and negatives as they relate to a specific sector of the creative industry, animation. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the animation industry and the new normal of remote work. Our brilliant panelists, who I'll introduce shortly, will dive into real insight into how animation studios were affected by COVID in those first few weeks and how studios went on to react and adapt to a new post-production workflow. We'll also cover the tools and pipelines that help the transition to new animation workflows and end with consideration about how the animation industry will flex and adapt to our new normal in the months and years to come. But before we dive in, I'd like to highlight that there's a chat feature in this Zoom session that's on. So please feel free to join the discussion. You can also ask questions and upvote questions via the Q&A feature below. And we'll put those questions to the panelists during our 15 minute Q&A, which will be right at the end of this discussion. Stay tuned, there's some really great stories about how some of these animation studios have adapted um, and actually some pretty stunning revelations about what's, what they're gonna be doing in the next few weeks, which I found out about yesterday and I'm still pretty stunned about. But first, let's say hi to our panelists. Um, all of them are from leading animation studios in the UK. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Hopefully they've got themselves off mute. And uh, I'm gonna start with you, John Rennie from Clothcat. Hey, Hi, doing? I'm, I'm, I'm John Rennie. I'm the managing director of Clothcat Animation and we're based in Cardiff in Wales. Thanks, John. Straight to you, Francesca from Blue Zoo. Uh, hi everyone, um, I'm Francesca from, from Blue Zoo, as Ian said, uh, I'm post supervisor and so I work in lighting and compositing and uh, Blue Zoo, if you know a little bit of it, is set uh, in London, uh, it's an animation studio that mostly focuses on um, preschool animation uh, and commercials as well. Thank you. Chris Lynch from Boulder Media. Hi, my name's Chris, I work as pipeline manager in Boulder Media. Uh, Boulder are based in Dublin, across two locations. Well, we're across lots of locations now since COVID. Um, we generally do children's TV series, but we're also producing a feature movie of My Little Pony. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we've got Emlyn from Bumper. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Emlyn. I'm creative director and the founder of the studio. Um, we're a little bit different to everybody else um, on the panel. Uh, I think everybody else does kind of longer formats. Uh, we're a creative production studio, so we do everything from still images uh, for ad campaigns, uh, pack shots, visuals, things like that, uh, all the way up to longer format animations as well. Thanks, Emlyn. Jardine from Fourth Wall. Hi, I'm Jardine from Fourth Wall. Uh, so we, I'm the assistant director on a show called uh, Milo. Uh, we're a pretty new animation studio. Uh, Fourth Wall was a publishing company, uh, still is a publishing company, and we've just got our first series and we're um, navigating that at the moment. Awesome. I'm going to launch straight into things um, and ask about what happened right at the beginning. Um, you know, how each studio that you worked at and that you run or that you're part of was affected by COVID-19. Um, Francesca, starting with you, I'm going to pick you first. <laughs> <laughs> so much pressure. How, how was Blue Zoo affected straight away? What, how were your projects affected? How was your crew affected? 
Um, so I'll say, um, actually, um, we coped incredibly well with it because uh, I think the major issue was that um, suddenly everybody had to move um, from the studio uh, home. And I think the uh, IT department was the one that was um, they had more work to do with that. They, I was talking to the IT yesterday and he said that in two, three days, it had to move uh, about 200 people from the studio back home. With all the problems that this obviously um, implies, meaning like that suddenly ITs couldn't just have like uh, people, um, I mean, people's workstation checked in the studio, but actually everybody's computers at home needed to be checked. And um, basically they needed to make sure that the computer worked, their internet worked. And I think uh, in, in general, like um, we don't consider that because a lot of people actually use Wi-Fi rather than uh, Ethernet cable. And that was one of the major issues, I think, because uh, the Wi-Fi is not that reliable. And, and some people just don't want to use the normal cable um, through their houses. I mean, a lot of people have really different um, situation at home as well. Uh, and so there were basically lots of surveys trying to assess if people could work from home, uh, if it was possible, which kind of equipment they needed. Uh, but I would say um, uh, it, it sounds like uh, um, that uh, Blue Zoo has been doing particularly well, actually, on the um, because VFX had probably a lot of issues with uh, not being able to uh, shoot live action footage. But Blue Zoo works on full CG. Uh, so um, as a paradox, we, it looked to me that we actually had more projects coming out. And projects that were supposed to start to be later, they started sooner. Um, so the, um, the effects were probably that we had uh, to suddenly recruit uh, a lot more people. And now we got up to 300 and people in the in the studio and we probably need to uh, do even to recruit even more and recruitment right. hasn't been really easy uh, in this period of lockdown I have to be <laughs> honest <laughs> okay I might ask you about that in a minute later as well sure. Emily what about you how did bumper how did this affect bumper you know in those first few weeks yeah exactly the same as uh, Francesca said it's kind of we the Welsh government is, was a little bit different to um, uh, the rest of the UK. So, you know, the, the conditions changed in terms of lockdown and when they were locking down and what the, and what the conditions were going to be. So we took the kind of approach of, you know, let's ship everybody out earlier. So I think everybody left the studio before the lockdown kicked in. Um, but they, we did have one crazy one where we'd um, we just start a new production coordinator. Um, so Molly came in and on her first day, she came into the city for one day and then we sent her home for the rest of it. She'd never physically met anybody. So, um, yeah, that was a bit of a crazy one. We, like I said, we're not, we're not as big as Blue Zoo. So, you know, we don't have 300 odd uh, staff. So I think we had um, 11 at the time and about another, I think, six or seven remote working as well at the time. So, yeah, it was a case of just exactly as Francesca said, you know, survey, work out what people have at home what kind of internet because we realized that the internet was the biggest bottleneck essentially um and then trying to figure out how we're going to get files back and forth what was the best way was it going to be remote working you know into the studio or was it going to be working on kind of some kind of file system in the cloud um and we went for that kind of remote working was, was better for us great Janine, going to you, um, fourth war what were the first things that happened when you know you guys had to lock down well, we're, we're in a bit of a different position because of what happened was um, around about February, we were crewing up uh, for a sort of series and it was a new animation studio. At the exact point when lockdown came in, that was when we were supposed to be kicking off pre-production. So uh, we have a very strange situation where we have 40 animators, designers, riggers. They've not met <laughs> because of COVID. <laughs> so we've, we've had to build a studio remotely. Um, and that wasn't our initial intention, but we had to quickly pivot to it. Um, and so, yeah, it was uh, much like what these guys are saying. It's, it's that heavily re heavy reliance on IT, figuring out what the best system would possibly be that we could put in place. How are we going to get these files across? How are we going to deal with the internet bottleneck, which I'm guessing everyone's had to deal with? And it varies so much. Like, you know, you could be in a city and the internet connections could be amazing. Or you may have somebody who's remote and then suddenly they've got very, very slow internet connections. And we had to figure out ways that we could get around those as well. Thanks for that. Um, Chris Lynch, but I, I'm, I'm really curious also, 
um, where the boulder had very similar problems as um, the other team or challenges or, or were you? We seem, we seem to all be happen? saying the same thing here as it goes along. <laughs> the, the IT were just uh, like the job that they had to do to get everybody off site was the biggest at the start. And just dealing with everybody's, as we said, internet connections, do people have good enough machines to run software? And then seeing what departments needed to remote into the studio, what the ones needed could work off site and then deliver files in and out. Um, so yeah, the first like week, two weeks was IT, heavy IT and facilities, getting people machines, making sure everybody's up and running. Um, but yeah, no, same, very similar to what Blue Zoo should be doing as well. Right. And what about you, John? Similar story. I mean, we started, we'd already had a couple of people working remote anyway, who were remote desktoping into the studio. And we were never really happy with how that worked because the speed of remote desktop was never great for animation. Um, so we were funny enough already looking for solutions to the home working problem when the pandemic hit. Um, so we actually tr sort of transitioned over to using that system that's slightly ad hoc, but it, it actually works out quite well. So uh, kind of fortunate for us, we we're at the end of a production using Cell Action, uh, which has the ability to export a SIM file. So like a consolidated animation file that allows you to work remotely. Um, if, we did, if this had hit last year in the middle of a CG production, it would have been a nightmare because you'd have the ever remote desktoping in, it would have been disaster. Um, so very fortunate we were working on quite a light production at the end of the production so we could transition. Um, some of our crew were already remote uh, working, some had to then isolate because they, they had underlying conditions. They had to isolate earlier so we all had to start getting those things into process. So about a week before lockdown we actually closed the studio altogether. Um, and actually I'm the only one in here now so I'm the only, only one in the studio at the moment. So I, I, it's, it's, it's fun for me, I get my peace and quiet, it's great for me. Um, but I think for us, it, it was a matter of just thinking in a slightly different way about how we were going to use the technology we already had. So we've ended up using uh, G Suite uh, and Google File Stream to synchronize files between people at home. Uh, people took their, um, their uh, computers home with them. So they had their machines, just took those home as well. So they made sure they had a good machine at home. Internet connection it's always variable, but actually sometimes people in the countryside have a better connection because it's subsidized and people in the city um, because that's just <laughs> been 20 years ago by Virgin Media or something. So um, to actually, it's, it's actually coped quite well. Um, and it, it, the biggest problem is not really the technology. We've actually made that work really nicely and F-Track has been a big part of that. Uh, but actually it's communication and it's a community, keeping people talking, uh, making sure people don't feel as if they're on their own. Uh, it's actually the, the kind of the kind of the health and safety bit is actually the challenging bit as well. Um, and we tend to find it's a bit of a balance really between uh, you know trying to make sure people are looked after, make sure they you know they're not feeling as if they're completely on their own uh, working at home, and then also supported and that they're not uh, you know sort of lost for technology. So we give them a chair, make sure they've got tables, uh, make sure they've got a good computer, big enough hard drive space to cache everything. It's just everything's all in one. So my job has become kind of, I don't, don't do much here anymore. I'm on messaging all the time, making sure people are okay. Great. And look, stick around everyone because John's got a pretty stunning story about what they're up to soon. Um, but I'll let him tell that a bit later on. I wanted to ask you all as well in that um, vein of what happened first. And I don't want you to necessarily name any projects if you're not comfortable doing that but I am really curious about what actually happened to any of your projects. Did you have to tell the client that they were on hold for a very short time or was it a pretty seamless transition? Um, Chris Lynch, do, what could you say about any projects that were going on at Boulder at the time? The, the projects didn't seem to suffer. I mean, we managed to get it up and running quite quick. It was, it was, it was good. And I, I think everybody kind of, because they might've gained that little bit extra in their day from not commuting and stuff and, you know, being at home, that everybody really chipped in and made it work. So it was like, it really made, the whole studio kind of came together and made, made it work. And there didn't seem to be any drop off in productivity or shows being delivered. So it was really useful. Actually, after I again, being able to suddenly just use it from home was just perfect, you know. Um, but no, it's, it seemed to run well. Great. What about you, Emlyn? Uh, yeah, I agree on the whole. I think the, the major th the thing was the, the communications for us. Um, I think 
Um, it did have a, a hit on production. Uh, it's just because you're having to read a lot more, you know, comms instead of being in the studio and being able to talk to, you know, your colleagues, um, having to be able to just, you know, go through reams and reams of, of text to make sure that, you know, a project's in the right place. You're reviewing things. And that's, that's where I think projects took a hit. Um, and obviously there's a little bit of downtime and obviously getting people out and making sure they had the right equipment. But um, yeah, on the whole, we, I think we delivered one of our biggest projects, which was the Tyler Childers music video, uh, which we were right in the middle of when, when it hit. Um, and yeah, you know, the client was amazing. RC said, you know, they, they, they were the same. They were in New York. They were getting lots of issues as well. So um, they, were, they were amazing to work with. And, and we pushed the deadlines back a little bit just to, just to give us a bit of breathing space. But um, yeah, I think it was more to do with the comms, really. Um, it, we took a bit of time to work out what we were going to use because we, we were using Slack at the time. We were obviously using F-Track um, for the, the big productions. Um, so yeah, it's was, it was more looking at what the comms and how, how you get those meetings and obviously tons of Zoom meetings. And yeah, comms was, was the biggest issue, I think, in terms of mm. that initial. Great. Francisca, what happened with Blue Zoo projects? It, did did anything have to stop for a couple of days or weeks? I'm, I'm kind of fishing here for a project that really went belly up and the client was either terrible or really nice. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's, I think there were, if there was any delays, I think it would be more like things like uh, last part of the project. So in general, I think everybody at Blue Zoo like, tried to really commit it to make it work as the other people said, because uh, I think it's, uh, it, we got really used to, even nobody asked for, uh, for that, but I think we got used to like sometimes reply to late messages, even in the evening, just because we are at the computer and so it comes naturally, but also because I think uh, we were trying to make it work somehow. Uh, so there weren't delays inside the production. Um, I've heard that a voice recorder it had that to be put on a hold. So um, obviously that's the only part of full CG that you have to do normally in a studio. And so voice recording was um, delayed. Um, and I think, oh yes, the, the, the last part, there was a project that we uh, basically finished delivering, uh, but usually we use another studio to check, uh, we call it the online delivery, so to check the, um, to, to make a final check. And in that case, uh, that also was postponed because uh, there was nobody in the studio. So internally, it went uh, really well. I think the communication was obviously, the, everything is delayed uh, in a way. Um, uh, communication wise but again people really made it work so no it's uh, <laughs> I'm sorry there's no <laughs> there's no like horror stories uh, about like yeah a project completely messed up uh, by the lockdown unfor unfortunately <laughs> lucky for us <laughs> no it's, it's obviously really great what about you Jardine was there anything in particular in terms of any projects that um, you know were affected yeah, I think, well, as I, as I mentioned before, we kind of were going into pre-production and that was probably the the one part of production that you really want, you don't mind being in a sort of like a siloed sort of a situation. Um, it, I think the real thing that we had to sort of like build, which is what I think I'm going to uh, touch on, which is that we had to figure out how we structure the days to have the communications and figure out how we talk to each other. And, um, you know, we, I'd worked on projects before with other companies where, where we use Slack. So we started using Slack as well. Uh, Zoom meetings in the morning, just sort of like to get the briefs going and make sure everyone's feeling like they're from the same page, making sure people aren't feeling siloed and just sort of on their own. Um, but, but generally speaking, it was, it was nice for us to just start with pre-production as it happened. So it allowed us to build up to the, the point where we, we had... Um, we had animation ready to go. Uh, within that time, we had to develop obviously lots of tools and stuff with F-Track and, and with some partners to actually figure out how Harmony was gonna work with F-Track and how all of those kind of things we could push through. Um, I think if, if that had happened at that point, we would have probably have been knocked a bit more off course, but <laughs> luckily, uh, luckily it happened that way around and we, we, we have it up and running and it's like, it's, it's, it's brilliant to use that and, and see it through. So yeah, but a slight delay, but generally generally speaking very good awesome i i am wondering again it's something that you you don't need to reveal whether you did or not whether any of your companies had a emergency plan or something like that in place to you know suddenly go remote say 
a server went down or there was a building emergency or a fire. This is pre COVID. Was that ever in anyone's consideration? Anyone want to chime in whether anyone had something like that ready to go? For a natural disaster. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we had an offsite backup anyway, because for insurance reasons, we've got to have offsite backup and, and everything else. So we always had disaster recovery, but not, not in the sense of trying to get everyone back into or, or away from the office, if you see what I mean, in this way. And mm. actually, to be honest, I think that's the good thing about what's happened is it's forced us to confront that because everyone treats it as a hypothetical for insurance, but never expects ever to have to deal with it um, because there's so many things in place and, and, you know, how often does it really happen? But now everyone's had to do it. It's actually, it's been quite a good thing. And it's forced us to actually use a lot of cloud technology that probably wasn't even available a couple of years ago, even last year, really, and use it more effectively and use it more intelligently. Um, we were already looking at ways in which we could cite people outside and give crew uh, who maybe couldn't um, commute every day or had childcare or everything else, the ability to work from home. Generally speaking, it came down to more an HR and insurance issue than it really came down to technology. But because of that, we never really confronted the technology. And now we've actually found a way around it that's actually more convenient and more accessible than the way that we originally thought we were going to have to do it. So I'm kind of kind of glad in a way. Thanks, John. Anyone else have anything vaguely planned for something this crazy as COVID? I mean, in, in some ways, I guess people were already able to work remotely because of tools we have, but it kind of went to 11 on this, didn't it? We did have, I mean, we had about six people working offsite already, kind of freelancers. So mm. initially when people went offsite, we thought we'll, we'll try and replicate exactly the way these offsiders are working, but Soon we realized just the like ingesting files into the studio and giving them back out again would be so time consuming and require more staff that we had to change. But yeah, that was the initial plan. But I don't know. But there was there was no plan of like for a natural disaster if we had to move people outside. Mm. Francesca? Uh, same here. I think what we had was like a really few people working remotely, but for really specific um tasks or jobs uh, positions. Uh, as a supervisor, I would never have uh, thought of working remotely before and there was never a, um, a talk about that. I remember like we had, we used to have like a remote desktop uh, access before as well, uh, but there were so many limitations, especially for lighting and compositing. Um, that uh, I remember because I was asking it, but obviously it wasn't a top priority. Um, they were looking into it, but there were like um, limitation with ADP, which was one of the, rem the remote desktop that we were using mostly. Um, so yes, it was like, a, it was unthinkable, but I'm sure like, the, I mean, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure Blue Zoo had like insurance and all, but um, yeah, the, we never thought in that scale <laughs> that things could change so much. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, same with us as well. We had the, we had the disaster recovery and we had people working remote um, in terms of freelancers, but they weren't working in the, in the way where they were remoted in. They were, you know, we would send files out and, and back and forth. So, um, yeah, that, like Chris said, we couldn't work to that business model, you know, and scale it. Um, but weirdly, towards the end of last year, we, we upgraded a lot of the systems in the studio. Um, and I actually looked into potential, you know, cloud serv services. So servers, actual you know, Amazon machines that, that you could use. Um, and it just wasn't, you know, a business case for it at the time. Um, just because it was a lot more expensive than, you know, to, to lease one of those machines for a year compared to, you know, buying, buying outright was, was just not, you know, it was the same price essentially. So, um, yeah, we, we looked into it because, you know, it was potential, but, um, yeah, COVID has kind of completely turned everything on its head. So. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to move on to, um, two sort of, management side of things, but it's also related to pipeline. Um, one is I come from more of a visual effects background where for so long, you know, you could never work from home in visual effects. And I'm sure it's the same in animation related to leaks and security was the big issue from the studios. How much did that come into play for each of you as we went to this remote um, workflow? Jadine, do you want to start 
on whether there were any major security or that kind of things you had to get over? Uh, to be honest, well, um, as, as we were doing it from, from the very beginning, we mm. were using F-Track as our main sort of like source for things and the back end was on a server backed up again as well. Um, it was, <laughs> it was a, a process of like, okay, this isn't working, so what do we find for the next thing that will possibly work for us? Um, I think we even started off when we had the server up and running, um, uh, VPN access, which just wasn't strong enough, wasn't, wasn't powerful enough for what we, what we intended. Um, using Google file stream, as, as John mentioned, is, is actually what, what we've ended up doing as well. And a similar thing with um, mirroring the server. Now, um, with regards to the uh, security side of it, it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but um, certainly we, we've sort of like put as much emphasis as we can to sort of like keep everything within the studio. <laughs> yeah. What about you, John? Take this off on, on mute there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a concern. I mean, the trouble is, yeah, we don't have, we aren't working necessarily for clients that require contractually to have a very, very robust security system. I mean, if we were working for Netflix or, uh, Apple or something else. I mean, goodness knows we wouldn't be able to do anything because the security requires multiple levels of access limitation and everything else. We, but then again, that's what you charge them for. So, you know, in the end, you kind of, you're trying to figure out the best way. I think, you know, we use, uh, Johnny and I, we use a very similar systems because we share similar, we share pipeline guys, actually pipe club guys. Um, so uh, funny enough, I think we kind of benefited both of us from <laughs> just trying out different solutions. Um, it's, it's not an ideal way forward, but a lot of it's down to trust. I mean, the thing is, even if you're working on a visual effects project, it's down to trust. Somebody could easily photograph a screen or something like that. I mean, if you look at it this way, how many Marvel spoilers have you heard coming up from a VFX company and they employ thousands, tens of thousands of people around the world all the time working on multiple films. Um, everybody knows that their job relies on a bit of security, a bit of trust, and looking after the projects they're working on. Otherwise, you know, they end up, you know, crippling the company they're working for and causing everyone to lose their jobs. That's the job, that's the, that's the, that's the industry you work in. It works on trust, everything works on trust. Um, you know, somebody could come in here, you know, with a hard drive and steal everything if they, not if they really want to, but anyway. Um, but it, 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 that's what it comes down to. Um, security works in both ways. Um, you know, yeah, maybe in the future we could actually work on a completely virtual system using Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud um, uh, systems. It, to be honest, that's probably possible now. Um, but and that would allow us to knock it down even more. Um, but to what end? And in the end, you want people to work with you, not work, not feel as if they're in some sort of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, lockdown security system and they can't do anything. You, you want artists to feel as if they're contributing to what they're working on. Um, so I think, I think for us, you know, yeah, Google file stream is, you know, in the end, well, actually the ironic, ironic thing was we were actually paying for it anyway. We just didn't really use it. Um, so uh, moving over to that system meant we didn't actually pay any more for it. And we had a completely, uh, synchronized system working across every, everybody working with the company and then synchronized into a Synology box here in the studio, which then access the render farm. So somebody remotely submits something and it automatically goes to the render farm there without us really having to do anything more and paying any more. It's not the most secure system, but it works great. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to continue using that and then look for something more robust to continue this afterwards. And I think, I think for a lot of other people as well, I mean, you know, we, we have, you know, servers here, we have render farm, we have storage. Just a lot of it's coming towards the end of life anyway. We're going to have to replace certain elements of our system as we were going. Now we're going, actually, you know what? Let's not bother having a fixed server in the studio. Let's actually have a virtual server. Let's have cloud storage. Let's have those things that we thought that we would never need or were going to be too expensive. Actually, let's look at the alternative and realize if we're not paying for such a big studio anymore, or we may only have a fraction of the size, half people work from home, as people work in the studio, we can actually afford to spend on those cloud things that actually make all of our lives a lot easier. Absolutely. Chris Lynch, uh, what about you? What security things did you have to deal with straight away, um, you know, at, at, as the pandemic, yeah. pandemic began? Unfortunately, I don't know a lot about the technical details of the security of it, so I can't really give up the answer. <laughs> All right. And I mean, just, just from looking at though, I guess like 
where I'd immediately see security things with moving people all working offsite is the environment they're working in offsite. And um, so who knows what environment they might be working. They might be in a house share of five, six other people, or they could be, could be any situation really that it might. So I guess that would pose a security risk going forward. So, um, but um, it's, sorry, I don't know the technical details of this. But, um, yeah. No, no, that's fine. I was just going to add, look, if anyone wants to email me privately, I can tell them a great security leak <laughs> visual effects related story in relation to a film called Wolverine from a few years ago. Oh, I'm sure many that. people know that one. But anyway, <laughs> Francesca, what about you? What, what, what do you know about how the security side of things worked at Blue Zoo? I want to say that I actually watched the Wolverine movies like uh, with Lam I think it was like things left in Lambert as well like uh, that you could see like the work in progress it was I think it really gave like uh, an input to people of how VFX works though so I think it, you know uh, it was helpful in a way <laughs> um, so in terms of like security I think it was I mean we had to um, yeah, as John said, that everybody said, like, I think we need to start from the assumption that we need to trust people because obviously otherwise we wouldn't have done anything. And also I think the client, I mean, I don't know specifically what was the conversation with the client, but the client had to accept to a certain extent that um, we couldn't control everything. So otherwise we would have to stop the uh, production. Well, I know because I had a long conversation yesterday with IT because I wanted to make sure I had the entire pictures and and what he told me is like it basically uh, it got to a point where he preferred people uh, not working if they couldn't work securely i mean in a secure um, system so working remotely uh, they set up a uh, um, two-factor identification so basically like they, we wanted to prevent any unauthorized access because basically it's not about the people that work in the studio that the, the major problem is the people that can access um the studio from outside and now i don't know i mean this is like i can be like a metropolitan legend um so i don't know exactly the specific but apparently there were there was a studio that uh, was hacked and then they asked for a ransom to give them uh, the data back uh, and obviously that would be a massive loss i mean we have backups and all but you don't want to deal with that and i think that was one of the major um concern i presume really uh, and again i don't know who was the studio i don't know anything i just heard it <laughs> um but but yeah that was quite uh, i think that would have been quite uh Troublesome, I think. <laughs> and Emma, what about you? Did you face any major security things that you had to get over at the beginning? Um, yeah, we had um, usually have a, a several NDAs in, in place with, with all the clients that we work with. Um, and most of them, uh, the one with Tyler was uh, quite strict um, as long as nothing got out on social. So, but like, you know, everybody said, it's, it's, it's down to trust, essentially. So, you know, I trust my team. The, you know going to be working on th things and they're not going to be disclosing anything um and then in terms of security we looked at we looked at loads of things um and i remember there was one funny one where they, they had this sales team just kind of talking at me saying oh yeah this is fully encrypted nobody can get to it it's two factor it's all this stuff and i said okay well what's you know could i just take a photo of the screen and then post that and they were like yeah yeah you could and there's essentially there's nothing you can do so it's all about mm. trust essentially yeah um so yeah but we, we set up VPNs, things like that, you know, to try and make it as secure as possible, essentially. And it, it, it's great to hear that word trust, and I think that's absolutely true. It, it also opens up that side of the um, remote working, which is your crew is really the most important part of this. And, you know, apart from all the technical side of things, um, internet, getting people set up, what has also been happening in terms of just keeping up motivation levels and, you know, managing the, the crew, John, I'm going to come back to you. What, how have you found that part of things? Cause you know, clearly some people like isolation. I might be one of them and some people, you know, they're much more into um, working with a big group. Are you saying that animators are social isolators anyway? Or <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I'm sure. Not saying um, no comment. Uh, no, I think I mean, the thing is, we've got there's always a balance when you're in the studio. Some people actually don't like being in an office environment, um, you know, uh, and some people with um, sort of mental, mental health issues are going to be then situation situation anyway. Some people prefer to be isolated or not around loud noise. So to be honest, even an office environment isn't ideal. Uh, and I think it partly it's about giving people choice. And now there's an opportunity to do that. I mean, I think before, yeah, you know what, you had everybody in the studio, 
people could talk to each other. There was the communal lunches, uh, the coffee machine, which I am drinking it myself now and slowly getting through it. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 there, is, there, is an, there is an atmosphere, there's the community there. And you've got to somehow replace that. But to be honest, we were mostly conversing over chat anyway when we were in the studio because everyone's sitting there with the headphones on, listening to mm. lip sync. They're chatting on, you know, uh, you know, on Google Chats or Slack or whatever. So there was already that in process. Um, there were already the monthly or bi-monthly meetups in Cardiff anyway because we have a, an animation group here that 150 people go to every other month. And then a film festival as well, an animation festival. So there was always a sense of community. So we just tried to continue that. Um, when lockdown hits, um, we were luckily at the end of a project and then a project we were due to start almost straight away got delayed because the funding got delayed because of the emergency funding that, that took priority. Luckily, we were able to put everyone on furlough to keep everybody going during the next few months while we waited for the project to finally get its funding and go ahead. Um, to, and again, one of those fortunate situations we were able to do that. Um, so and and even then we were able to keep the communication going you know people talking to each other everyone's friends on facebook uh and now we have a slack system set up we have a google system set up uh there's um you know weekly team meetings that everyone has to log into and talk to the production manager and the production coordinator has a lot more work to do making sure people are okay but they were kind of doing that anyway checking in on everyone and again f track allows us to keep an eye on what we're doing, what the team are doing, how everyone's managing, you know, what speed everyone's going at, and we can respond to those problems. So in some ways it's, uh, you know, uh, what we're trying to do now is also set up week, sort of monthly meetups in the park, as some, some kind of social distance way of meeting up. Unfortunately, the Welsh weather and storms last week uh, meant we couldn't actually do that. Um, so <laughs> fingers crossed for this Friday uh, in Butte Park, but we'll see what happens. Um, and I've got all the picnic stuff ready to go. But, um, but I think that's what we're trying to do is trying to get that sense, you know, sense of being a part of something so people can't lose track. Um, but actually what we have now is people who are at home uh, in, you know, it's obviously quite far distance. Some people in West Wales, some people, you know, have gone home, you know, to England. So it's trying to make sure people don't feel as if they're completely isolated from everything. They are still part of the whole group. Um, I, think, I think we're quite fortunate that we always had that kind of mentality in the studio. Um, that we're actually, you know, reasonably small, reasonably tight crew. People have worked on previous productions. They know everybody. It's not, it's not a whole new thing to everybody. Um, but I think, I think that's the challenge going forward is um, this is going to be the new normal. There's it, we aren't going to come back to being in a studio in the same way. Um, you know, there's the Sky call centre that got closed down in Cardiff literally a couple of days ago because a couple of people had COVID. You know, we can't open for that reason. We can't open because if anybody comes in contact with it, we have to close anyway. So I think for the next year or so, we are, this is going to be where it's going to be. We are going to have to adapt to this. Uh, but I think some people are going to want to have that flexibility to work at home uh, to, you know, or to, to work in the studio for a couple of days or, or go on holiday for a month with their kids uh, and work from there. You know, you know I don't mind. I, I don't mind where somebody is working so long as they're able to work and they're happy. Um, if we can provide that opportunity, why not? This and, and animation is fortunate. We're not um, we're not live action. You know, not last week and not visual effects. We've been able to carry on working, and I think we have to show uh, how we can make that you know really interesting and uh, the twenty first century way of doing things. Not assuming we all have to come back into a studio or an office environment in the same place at the same time just because health and safety said we have to. Let's try and find new ways mm. to do this. This is the new century for a reason. John, do you wonder if there's anything lacking from a kind of face-to-face -face meetings? Um, and how can you explain any way that you've dealt with that? Kind of put big meetings and... Um, well, I think, actually, actually, you know what? I think it's better. I mean, so long as everyone logs in on, on Zoom. Actually, I found, personally speaking, I found meetings a lot better. Um, a lot of the industry meetings like Animation UK, because they've been promoting the fact that the animation industry is continuing I'm on, on the panel for that. Actually, before, because I'm in Cardiff, we felt quite isolated from what was going on in London. There's all these big London centric meetings, everyone would come together. You could hear everyone drinking tea and eating cake or whatever. And I'd be <laughs> a very scratchy phone line wondering what the hell was going on. And then two hours later, somebody would go, Oh, yeah, John's on the end of the phone. Any questions? And I go, No, not really. Um, Do you want now, pastries? <laughs> everyone's the same size square on, on, on the computer. Everyone's the same. Everyone, you know, even if you're in Australia, you are the same size square on a computer screen. You're able to chip in together. 
we've already got the kind of mute yourself and unmute yourself kind of thing going on that, that everyone's figured out very quickly. To be honest, I find this more democratic uh, and, 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 and open than it was before. I don't want to go back to being forced to go to London every you know, month or so to have meetings because frankly, it took a whole day out of my life. Uh, it, it was hugely expensive. Um, this is so much better. It's quicker, easier. Uh, you know, everyone's more efficient and everyone can see each other. Um, mm. and can laugh at whatever they got in the background as well. So, you know, it's actually, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually preferring this way of working because I think it brings everyone, ironically enough, closer together, except for those moments that, you know, you do need to, need, need to be in a room together. But overall, actually, you know, some of us had never met. I mean, we know, we know of each other, but some of us never met. And actually, this is an opportunity to do that. So I'm actually happy with it. Yeah. yeah. Have, have, do other people feel like that? Chat in or yeah. even Chris? Chat in. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, as I said, we because we've been remote from day one anyway. So we've not actually I've not met a lot of my animators face to face, which is it's so bizarre to me. But at the same time, they've they've been absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, we, we much like what John's saying there, we kind of had a, a very similar thing where we every morning we do kind of like a 10 15 minute on zoom where we just say hello to each other and that's not necessarily like 40 people saying hello at once because obviously that on zoom would be terrible but it would be like each team would just sort of like say hello to each other and it's and it's it's kind of grown that way the and then the issue is is just making sure that the teams talk to each other as well from from beyond that um and and it allows us to sort of kick off the day right where we don't feel like people are, are drifting too far away from each other and and people can feel like they're actually part of something. Um, what we're looking at at the moment, because obviously we, we didn't have a studio at the beginning and we actually are gearing up to finally build out our studio now in lockdown uh, or post lockdown. Um, and we're looking to sort of like figure out how we can stagger that so that, you know, there isn't too many people in, in the office at the time or, you know, people can go in there and, and get the social side of this as well because of uh, something that was really, keen for me to always sort of like say to the other animators and for for the um, scene setup as, especially when you had sort of like entry-level positions you want them to feel like they're part of a team and you want to make sure that they feel like there are things going on in the studio and they can see all the animations being made and hey isn't this cool let's let's show it to people because that's the bit that's very easy to lose when you're when you're in this situation and so we make sure that they're sort of like hey you've got some cool animation post it here let's let's keep the conversation going and um, you know everyone gets to see some nice bits of work and stuff. So um, that's, that's kind of where we're at at the moment with it. And um, you know we, we're trying to make sure that, that people feel like they're they're part of they're part of a team more than anything else. And um, mm -hmm. we think it's it's working. But obviously, to to what John's also saying there is obviously we're in the northwest. Um, myself, I'm actually in Manchester. The, the studio is in Liverpool, and we have uh, we have an art director in Ireland. And we have um, one of the one of the lead background artists is in France, and all of these people had actually made the commitment before COVID to move to Liverpool. And now we kind of turned around and said, you know what? Well, you know, you can, you guys can stay where you are if you want to. If you want to move, that's brilliant. But we can actually accommodate this. We can we can make sure this is fine. We have um, riggers in in Canada as well, and it, it kind of it. it it's allowed us to sort of like open up the door a little bit more and actually figure out, okay, this team doesn't need to necessarily be in the Northwest. And it's, it's useful for us too, because of uh, London does sort of like have a lot of the talent down there. And, you know, there's a lot of talent up in Manchester as well. And obviously down in, in Bristol and Cardiff, and it's allowing people to say, okay, you don't necessarily need to be in those places because of one of the other things about animators is that when a series finishes, they may need to move for the next series. And that, that is not, it's not a productive way to work. And one of the positives that we may need to be looking at is the fact that people can have a bit more of a family life and actually just stay where they are and actually remote in and work on their work. And, you know, it doesn't really affect production of animation. Mm, absolutely. Francesca, just jumping to you, how, how has the management of crew side been at Blue Zoo? Um, so on, on this side, I think like what my major worries I found that uh, became people's well-being in terms of mental well-being. I think a lot of people, okay, a lot of people actually still prefer 
to um, to work um, from home because I think like I mean we were all commuting to London. I think the uh, the major issue there is like yeah the transport are expensive. Um, you spend probably I mean a person I was spending two hours uh, going and uh, returning back from uh, from from the studio. So obviously that's times that uh, is saved. So like it's, it's time that I don't have to spend there. And I think this is like. Um, the same for a lot of people and there was a survey at Blue Zoo because uh, we did a lot of surveys just to check on people basically like if they were doing okay and basically only five percent of the entire studio were was happy to return to London for five days a week the majority actually uh, are super happy to work remotely to work from other area to yeah to go back to their families uh, I don't know in Italy in Spain and and work from there so I think there was a lot of thinking about that and people realized that they could work in a different way. So this, this was a nice as aspect of it. On the downside, I think one of the things I find harder is that um, we do have these dailies every day. We do check on, in, on each other. We have this also this nice coffee breaks, like a meeting on Zoom, to just like have a, a relaxing chat every day. And, and we have Friday showing to keep the community um, or other events like a you know, clay sculpture evening. Um, but then I think there is always a moment where the person is on his own with his own problems and issues on uh, technically uh, technical issues. And I think for junior artists, this has been particularly tough, I think, but not only for them, also for people more seniors. I found sometimes that was like, a, that sometimes they're really happy. Sometimes there are people that suddenly feel like really depressed on that day because maybe nothing worked out and they had to figure out a lot of things by themselves. And, and you have this moment when you suddenly have a Zoom call and you can release all the stress and say, oh, nothing worked today. And, and that really helped. Uh, we had uh, this um, lockdown workshop, which is, wasn't a workshop, it was actually a meetup of um, supervisors and head of departments to just check how things were going. And I found it, people just released all the stress saying, oh, yes, no, nothing was working. I couldn't talk to this person or this department was like really busy this day. And I think all these kind of things uh, that normally would happen um, in a studio um, and you will always feel like surrounded by people physically and you also think like you can turn around and talk to the person next to you even just to run for a moment because Maya doesn't work uh, and the fact that you cannot do it um, made it like a bit more difficult sometimes um, on a mental level for people so yes really like making sure people are fine I think is one of the main concern on the, on the new production I found. Great. And Emlyn, what about you in terms of crew management and mental well-being? Yeah, it's exactly the same as, as Francesca just said. Um, we did some surveys and I genuinely was expecting everybody to say, yeah, I don't want to come back into the office ever again. I want to work from a, you know, a beach in the Bahamas or something. Um, but yeah, I was genuinely surprised that lots of them did want to come back into the studio. Um, but in terms of you know, being more flexible, so maybe one or two days a week um, and we work something out. But um, currently we're just we're looking at we're just waiting to see what happens essentially. So everybody's going to stay remote for a while. Um, and in terms of then the kind of social aspects, uh, you know, we, we did, I think everybody did the zoom kind of quizzes, pub quizzes, things like that. Um, we try to do everything that, you know, to try and make sure we engage everybody as well in meetings uh, and make sure, cause there's always somebody that's going to be quiet, you know, it's trying to make sure that you, you, you speak to everybody. Um, but yeah, I generally do miss having people in the studio because like John, I'm, I'm in the studio on my own now and there's, there's literally nobody here. So, you know, I end up talking to the aircon for 20 minutes or something just to get me by. But um, yeah, I do miss having, you know, not, not being able to go to the pub as well on a Friday and just having those, you know, those, those chats about random stuff that, you know, it's not work related. It could be something completely personal or different. That, so those are the things we, you know, I miss in terms of the day-to-day -day working in the studio. Great. Thanks everyone for those. Um, I'm going to jump to some more technical pipeline questions in a second, but I wanted to encourage everyone watching to please keep sending in your questions. There's already some great ones that I've seen um, and we will get to as many as we can towards the end. It, here's here's the, the pipeline thing. I think what's really interesting is you've all mentioned a little bit about how you've quickly had to pivot with technology and um, pipeline tools. I wonder if each of you can also go into some more detail um, with what you did do pipeline wise and what you're doing now into the future. Um, because now we've had a few months to 
do things. It's still a mad scramble, I'm sure. But um, I, I wonder if you can talk about, about the, the technical solutions you're now employing, looking to employ into the future. Um, I'm going to start with you, Frances- Francesca, um, just uh, for no real reason, but just, <laughs> just to um, t- talk to us about pipeline. Yes. Um, so I think like the, the, main, the first thing we did uh, was actually trying to assess uh, which kind, how we wanted to work remotely. So before, because we obviously didn't, I mean, when, uh, before the lockdown was triggered in the UK, uh, we knew that was going to happen. I mean, there were like a uh, clear, clear sign from the rest of the world. So uh, IT was already start looking into that. And I remember they were like working a lot to just get things ready. And at the end, I mean, they wanted to go, uh, I know they wanted to go for one system, um, a remote desktop, but that wasn't working for everybody. Uh, initially, I said it before, before the lockdown, we, we were using ADP uh, as remote desktop, but it had limitation. It was like a problem with some application, so you couldn't fully work. It was basically like a, um, a mix of NVIDIA drivers, like which weren't working um, with ADP. And that means like some application were limited or couldn't fully work. And that was the limit that we had until now, at that moment. So we went to for Teradici and um, HP RGS. At the moment, personally, I'm using uh, HP RGS, which worked great. I mean, it's like I didn't really have problem with it. So I think that my major issue is like the two-factor identification because I, every now, like I have, I go for a coffee or for a tea. I just need to log back in, uh, which is for security reasons. So it makes sense. Um, they went for different uh, setup because I think uh, different departments um, had different um, different things that they needed. So now, for example, like there was um, a particular system. Like I need to check with my. Uh, no, so like I think there was a, a specific like system that had problem with like, the Wacom, Wacom connection. Ah, yes, the Radishi, sorry. Uh, and that was uh, basically like, so whoever like had to draw like concept artist would have problem with it. So that's why they were moved on another um, setup. And then suddenly Nvidia um, released a new driver. And so ADP could also be used and it's proved really effective. And I think there was a mix of this because also a different system had different, yeah, in general, different advantage and, and different, uh, different pro and cons. And um, I think what the IT really likes, they told me they really likes the, um, uh, the HP RGS is that can do shadowing, uh, which sounds really uh, fishy, but basically they can go into our computers uh, and access it and see what we're doing, which is not because they just trying to uh, make sure we work. It's because literally they, it might be helpful to help us with technical issues, which I don't think Teradici can do at the moment. So yeah, there were like different approaches. Uh, and I think going forward, they want to go for one approach which could be Teradici for now, it looks like, but um, apparently they're still looking into costs. Um, so there might be that um, Teradici might be, uh, I mean, they're, they're different licenses basically. So HP uh, RGS as a perpetual license. Um, so it costs more, but then you have it for forever while Teradici doesn't have that. So obviously when it comes to 300 employee, um, that's probably a consideration you need to, uh, to take into account. Um, so that was a part of it. And then uh, I think for reviews was another thing we had to change our mod- way of doing it. So we introduced CineSync. So CineSync was, is, a, is a software, for who doesn't know it, it's a software that um, it's uh, basically used uh, for uh, synchronized um, uh, videos, which means like uh, that normally we would have like we would do um, a, comp- a compositing reviews, like an editing reviews in the edit suite, uh, but now we couldn't do it physically. So we introduced CineSync, which allows us to download the the uh, the, the, the the episode basically of which we're working on, uh, and we can all synchronize it, and everybody from their own machine can stop the videos, uh, put marks on the video. So um, it's a bit more. Co- cooperative I found so I think like in the when we were doing it in the studio only the editor would, would move the timeline and just literally like uh, show us what we needed and, uh, and we would comment on it now I think everybody's a bit more involved so in that sense the comp review actually works better this way uh, with CineSync um, and apart from that yeah massive use of Zoom massive use of, uh, of that truck um, we try and generally to uh, implement the pipeline. Uh, that was obviously something we had in mind before we were working on it, but we're trying to make it so F-Truck is basically uh, the core 
uh, to access every other software and every software uh, communicate perfectly with it. Uh, it is to a certain extent already like that, but we want to improve it because obviously it's nice to have um, only one software for which you can control everything else, uh, which wasn't a necessity before, not as much. But yeah, this is mostly it, I think, uh, in terms of softwares. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. And in, look, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, F-Track actually acquired Cospective, which was the makers of CineSync, which is really good news, um, late last year. So um, I'm, I'm sure many people already know about CineSync. Chris, jumping to you, what, what, what were the technical pipeline solutions that you've ended up finding and what, what's happening into the future with Boulder? Yeah, it's similar to Francesca there. I mean, initially the, we had RGS set up and so remoting in, it would work for some people remoting in and not so good for others. People who needed a real free flow in live update, it didn't work so well. It's like some concept background art that wasn't working for well and like hand drawn animation, not so good. Um, but other like animation actually still remote in and seems to be working fine. Um, but yeah, which is useful because then we don't have to transfer a lot of like harmony files in and out of the building, re input them into the server, manage it that way. So that does work well. Um, but yeah, no, anybody doing drawing and needed real good feedback on the system or like pinpoint color reproduction, that wasn't, that wasn't going to work so well over IGS. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're doing now. And I mean, it, it is working. It's good. Everybody seems quite happy with it. Um, and that's for us, yeah. <laughs> Great. I said that's Emma, what about pretty you? much defined what we No, do. I know she did a and technical like, what? There it is. masterclass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I went too long on that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that fine. was great. Yeah. It was like, yeah. Emlyn, yeah. what about you at Bumper? What, what's, what was the solutions and what's happening into the future? Back for, you know, production uh, coordinating. So that, that was key, um, you know, before uh, and during this. Um, and really, before the, the COVID outbreak, I, I tried to get a, a Teradici demo, and I've still not had it. So if, if somebody Teradici watching, can you please sort that out? Um, so yeah, we, we tried loads of other ones. We went through, we must have gone about four or five different ones that we went through um, just before lockdown. Like I said, the team were amazing. They just went off and, and researched as much, much you know, as many applications as they could. So, you know, to do with communications, um, so we looked at, we were already using Slack, um, but then we looked at Discord, which is more of a games kind of um, application. And we found that really good as well, because we could use that to, to do um, the video calls. You could do it, use, you know, just voice calls. So you could ch quickly jump into a meeting room, discuss something really quickly and, and jump. Because of the way Bomb is set up and the kind of work that we do as well, you know, it's for long format stuff, it's great to, to be able to just rely on F-Track. You've got the schedule, you know, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to manage and control, but we have a lot of smaller projects as well. Some of our projects can be like two or three days. Um, so you have to be really agile and, and, and really quick to get those. Sometimes they don't even get to F track because you know, it's so quick. The client wants them yesterday. Um, so yeah, it's been, been agile and having that communication was, was really key for us. Um, and yeah, we heavily rely on, on discord um, F track for the bigger projects. Uh, and then for kind of remoting in, we tried loads of different ones. Uh, Parsec was really good, which I was surprised at because that's more for gaming. Um, but it, it was really good in terms of the frame rates that you could get. So animators could, could animate, uh, which was good. Um, AnyDesk was really good as well because you could, you could share screens. You could also switch to dual monitors. So we found that really good. And you could also then access um, files as well. So you could you know, upload and download files as well. It was a little bit slow because it, it relies um, the way that it actually interprets the files and, and, and transfers them is slower. Um, but yeah, th those are the things that we kind of found. It was more the comms and, and Discord that we, we found was the, the big impact for us. Awesome. Jadine, what about you? So I think um, we, we touched on it a little bit from, uh, from talking with John as well. We, we share a, um, a technical direction team uh, called Pipe. Um, what they've been able to help us with is sort of an integration with F-Track to allow us to open Harmony directly through um, F-Track. And that's been like our main source of it. Because of, um, because of when we started, we didn't have the machines already installed. And we, 
we decided to pivot to actually using people's machines at home and sort of assessing what people had and figuring out what we could use from what people had already. And then where it wasn't um, sufficient enough, trying to supplement and, and get machines sent out to them so that we could then gear up for the remote sort of like style setup later on down the road. Um, but what we have is uh, using uh, F-Track and Pipe is being able to just sort of like launch all of our scenes directly from, um, from F-Track so that they, it downloads from the file stream exactly the, um, the scene that they'll be working on and then they can work in it, uh, get everything ready, publish it, and goes back up onto F-Track and then obviously publishes out the, um, the thumbnails as well uh, for, for review. And um, we found that to be really, really good. It's obviously been a bit of a teething process because of it's had to sort of like, we've had to figure out how it could work. And then by the time we actually got to animation, luckily it was there and it was working. Uh, and it's been, it's been fantastic really. Um, and uh, it's, it's allowed us sort of like to go through all these different phases and, and see very, very quickly where it is that we um, are, are needed and what, what, was, what was going wrong and then what our limitations were. And I think one of our one of our limitations at the moment, obviously, um, is can be kit, but we will be sort of like transitioning into the kit in the studio pre relatively soon as we um, open up uh, there. Awesome. And John, I'm going to come to you last, but um, before I do, please keep your questions coming in. We're going to we're going to hit the Q and A really soon. There's a bunch of great questions I noticed about how this all impacts. Um, entry level or new employees and recruits. And we've talked about that a little bit in the panel, which is some people haven't even met other colleagues um, yet, but I think there's some really great questions about what all this means for new people coming into the industry. John, the reason I left you last in that, you know, what are you doing into the future question is because the other day you revealed to us something that is happening at Clothcat, which I think is really fascinating. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, based on basically your COVID experience? Yeah, I think, I mean, I touched on it earlier. We were kind of already looking at ways in which we could use the cloud a bit more because we wanted to give people a little bit more flexibility. We, we were not always able to track crew to Cardiff uh, like a lot of other people that, you know, were in different places, you know, attracting people, particularly highly skilled people to stay in Cardiff is not always easy. Uh, and it, and as somebody said, it does become a young person's game animation because you're moving around all the time. When you want to put down roots, you want to stay in a city or in a, you know, in a, in a certain place or find somewhere with a good, uh, you know, good living place. So um, we, we were sometimes losing people that way. So it was already in the back of my mind that we had to do this. Um, and I think the irony is forcing us to look at cloud solutions means that actually, even if we do come back to a studio eventually, or maybe two studios in two different places maybe, the infrastructure will still work, or we need an internet pipe. So actually we need less infrastructure than we had before, because we're not wedded to a server room sitting in a particular spot that you have to be networked to. So we have a studio here in Cardiff that actually has been kind of half full for the last year, because we finished, we had 110 people here uh, until June, May, June last year. It's been half full since then. We're probably gonna, we're gonna give it up anyway. Uh, because it, we were just half full, it was paying for space we didn't need. Now we are literally in a space where nobody is, and I'm, I'm moving my camera around to show you a completely empty studio space. Uh, and we're breaking all that down because, um, as I said before, you know, we can't, if anything goes wrong, it, you know, the health and safety of the crew is the most important thing, not whether or not I've got a studio I can sit in. Uh, you know, if we have to shut down, we have to shut down very quickly uh, because of COVID. We don't have to have everyone working from home anyway. So I'd rather make sure that that works better. And in the future, if we want a studio somewhere in Cardiff or somewhere in Manchester, maybe uh, as a supplementary studio, maybe if we want to work with people there, then we can actually just put people in a room, put computers, connect to the internet, and it's all cloud-based, all synchronizes, and exactly as it was, uh, you know, it has been, has been for the last couple of months. So that means that uh, you know, we, we've got a bit more choice and also our crew can come in for maybe two days, maybe one day. Uh, they don't have to commute. They don't have to commute so far. Uh, they don't have to use such, you know, sort of high spec kit. Maybe they can use lower spec kit and maybe use some cloud services a bit better. So I think this is, this is our new way forward. Uh, so I'm sitting, I'm here most of the time now breaking all this apart and figuring out what to do with it all. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm quite looking forward to that challenge. 
Uh, and with the technology side, as, as people said, we're using F-Track. Uh, we're already using F-Track more and more and more to do our work. We're already uploading MP4s to it to review. So everything was kind of cloud-based anyway. The only difficult bit was the files we were working on. And by moving over to Google File Stream, it means that with unlimited storage in the cloud anyway, everyone synchronizes the files but only downloads what they want to. And then a Synology box in the, in the back room there with a, with a beta version of the plugin that was only available a couple of months ago, automatically downloads everything as it's going. So I have a, ironically enough, I have more backup now than I did at the start of the pandemic because I have Google with a 30 day recycle bin. I have a, my Synology box as a hard backup with an even bigger recycle bin. Uh, and then the, the render farm just sits there running off the whole thing with deadline in the background. Um, so I, I think for me, I'm actually, everything's more flexible. I have less hardware issues because I'm dealing with less uh, in, you know, IT infrastructure. Um, and actually my life is a bit calmer. Um, I think actually removing some of those bottlenecks was a good thing, forcing us to, to confront those issues. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people do want to come back to the studio. We had a lot of people going, can we come back please? And, you know, said, well, unfortunately it's costing a lot of money to keep this place empty and the lights on. Um, but I think in future, this is actually a greener way of working. Uh, you know, we don't have all the lights or the air con and everything else. We can have a studio with computers in, connected to the internet. We don't have a big, uh, you know, render farm or, or, or server room sitting there gu guzzling electricity. This is a greener way of working, more flexible way of working, a more, you know, um, a friendlier way of working, I hope. And we just need to then just deal with those uh, communication issues, making sure people are structured properly. You know, we need a bit more of a, you know, a, a management structure to make sure people are looked after. But I think this is the way forward. Um, and coming on to the question about new people, we we're kind of, we don't have so many new people on this project because we had people who were furloughed and then we kept them going, fortunately. Um, which is great for them, obviously. With new people, I think that is a real problem. Um, but then again, think about it this way. Um, yes, it's potentially a problem, but then you can always have people on multiple screens. You can be talking to them. You can be talking them through things. You can share screens. You actually have more contact with people than you had before. But also for learning, for teaching, a lot of the um, uh, you know sort of uh, courses were all done. You had to be... I, actually, in a lot of the case in London, go to like Escape Studio, so we had to go there once a week to learn some action or something. A lot of these courses are all on, be forced to go online and actually embrace the technology. And I think there's actually more access to learning now than there probably ever was. Mm. Uh, I think for animation, that's a good thing. Universities aren't always the most ideal way of learning how to do a skill, because uh, they're not really necessarily teach you the software. Now you can learn it all online. Actually, there's no excuse not to learn something anymore. Uh, the only excuse is not to actually use it and put it into practice. Um, so any, anytime we're looking for people, you know, we're looking for people because their skills, not because of which university they went to necessarily. We're looking for their, you know, their ability, their showreel, their ability to perform, um, and their ability to perform in a group. And so this is just a natural part of it. Uh, you already had to work as a team. So... If you're not able to work as a team, you weren't able to work in the office as a team. So, you know, it, it, it's just the same. You've got to be able, those skills you need to be able to learn. And if you can use these remote systems and actually work together, then whether you're in a studio, whether you're remote, you know, you can cope with that, I think. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, John. I know I think it's fascinating what you guys are doing. And um, thanks for leading into that learning and, and bringing new people on thing as well. well I'm going to ask the rest of the panel that, that question too. The original question comes from um, Ria, I think it is. I might read it in full because it's quite a, it's quite a good question. Um, what do you think these remote changes to the production pipeline mean for new and entry-level recruits or interns? So specifically in, for them. And also in terms of in-person mentorship and learning, what, are, what do you think the impacts are on those positions in studios? Um, does anyone want to chime in with a view on, on how things are affecting those new and entry-level recruits or interns? Chris? Yeah, just like not too much, but I, I, de I definitely think there's a little something lacking in training and sort of induction when you say, because it's much easier for someone to be sitting working away and they might have their peers right beside them and see their monitors and, oh, you're doing it this way and how can I help you with that? And they can immediately lean over and kind of, give them a hand and I think that's quite fast and free-flowing and people get quite friendly with each other and look I, I think you know probably going forward we're all going to adapt to 
to you know more across doing this across the internet and helping that way but it, it for me i definitely see that as lacking at the moment is that an initial hello how are you sit down feel relaxed and then start using your computer i can see everybody else around me is doing the same thing um, the, the human touch really that's yeah mm. What about you, Francesca? Um, so I found it like that uh, for, it's not that bad. It hasn't been so bad. I've hired some junior recently uh, and I found that they cope really well with it. Uh, I made more tutorials. I made more, uh, so like basically as soon as someone starts, um, they will receive some tutorials. So for lighting and compositing, they will have really specific tutorials to watch and um, comprehensive inductions as well. Uh, there is always a Zoom call so that we, we found the pattern that we keep using and then there are always dailies uh, for the junior artists to catch up with their leads or with me. So they're not on their own, but I found that was much more strict with the recruitment. So I think I, while last year I would have afford to hire someone that was more junior in terms of experience or had more to learn. Uh, this year I would still hire for junior position, people that just been graduated, but their showreel had to be perfect. Uh, I had to get the impression from the interview that they could cope perfectly and independently with their, their job. And I found in a way, uh, it's really educational for them because um, I was much more hands-on at the beginning when people were starting before in the studio. Now I cannot do that. So I rely much more on the fact that they are reliable and independent to a certain extent, obviously. I mean, they can still talk to us about the problem um, they're having, but uh, they still need to do their job independently for most of the day uh, and I think like the uh, as, a, as a someone that just uh, out of school uh, this is something where they need to put much more an effort and uh, so they make they make them grow much quicker uh, than rather than me being just on their back uh, like next to them and being able to help them as soon as they have a problem they have to even spend like five minutes to think of the problem if they don't find a solution that, that then they will contact me so it, in a way I think it's not that bad and actually went for the best. I think they, the, the, yeah, the new juniors we hired were like uh, been really good and they've been really responsible as well. The extension to that question, maybe I'll come to you, Emlyn, is people asking whether, okay, now that there's this remote working happening, usually everyone had to live in London or Cardiff or Manchester. And, and you sort of talked about this or someone talked about it before. People are asking, well, can I, live in Australia or the Ukraine or South America and apply for a job at your studio now, can that be a thing? Yeah, well, going forward, that's, that's something we've been looking at in terms of flexibility. Um, for us, I think John touched on earlier about attracting people to Cardiff. Essentially, you, you know, you're trying to pull them back over the bridge from London, um, most of the times for animators, things like that. Um, so, yeah, we at the minute, we 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 trying to see how the land you know it lies in the next couple of months what you know what the potential is um obviously we need to think about the the current staff that we have and, and making sure that their their contract their you know employment is is what they want as well uh so then we can offer potential remote working um but yeah what's good for us is that it does open up a pool of resource the potential is that we could you know hire somebody from anywhere in the world now. um so that that i think that's a huge benefit it just depends on how we we're looking to to push the studio and and honestly we don't know yet like i said I, I do prefer having people in the studio because just because of the nature of some of the work that we do it is really fast paced we have to be quite agile um for the bigger jobs though for and for certain um the certain job roles as well like definitely animators don't really need to be on site as much i don't think because you know, they, they get a shot, they, they, they can do the progressions and, and, and we can review them. Um, it's a little bit different when it comes to when you need the actual render power that we have in the studio. Because we use a lot of GPU rendering, that's all in the studio. And also there's, there's a lot of um, heavy files as well in terms of the GPUs uh, and the, you know, the files that we, we, we're going back and forth. You, that's not something you can just throw out remotely and, and, and throw files back and forth. So it's at the minute we're just trying to work out what what the plan is um but yeah and it, currently we need to work out what the what our current staff want and needs are and then once we know that we can start potentially you know looking at um remote working 
and it, it, it always boils down when, when you look at any kind of you know anybody that's applying for a job it's the show reel that's the first thing you look at all the time so you know if you've got a good show reel then you've got a foot in the door already i'm going to ask a question in a minute um i'll come i'll i'll come to you john for sure um about someone's asking um uh what advice would you give to someone applying for a job in the pandemic? But we'll come to that in a minute. John, what were you going to weigh in on? I was going to come back to something because Evan and I, obviously we're in, in Wales. Uh, there's, there's, there's limitations with hiring people remotely is going to be because we've got support from Welsh government, which means we have to hire yes. people in Wales. Uh, you're going to have the same thing in Ireland, Northern Ireland and other regions as well. So, you know, there are, it, I mean, I, on one project, I don't have that problem. So I have somebody actually working in Australia or somebody in two people in Ireland. So the irony is, is that we're, and they were able to work better than they were before because they're not remoting in, they're simply just accessing the files from the cloud. However, there's going to be more importance put to regional funding and that nation's funding now, particularly in the UK. And then obviously overseas with Canada, Australia, you know, and other, other countries as France in particular, perhaps. So yeah, it's, it, you're going to have access to people, but whether you can use people, you're still going to have to have the postcode that is the nation or region that is giving you that funding for a reason. So, you know, you, you still have to bear that in mind. So there we go. Absolutely. Jadine, did you want to weigh in at all about, um, you know, this different kind of thing that has to happen now for people that are starting new? I mean, you're a new animation studio. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we, we've got kind of like that quite across the board at every level. And it is, um, it's, it's definitely been challenging, but it's, it, it all goes back to what I think Emmeline's touched on there, which was showreel, is that, uh, and Francesco, is when we were going through the um, hiring process and we were looking at all of the animators, scene setup, riggers and designers and stuff and looking for people that were, that were competent, but also looking for entry level positions. But when they were looking at the entry level positions, we were look, looking and saying, right, okay, this person obviously is, 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 is clued in really, really enthusiastic, but also has got some talent there that, that we feel like we can utilize. And I think that, I mean, that's always been the case when you're hiring. But I think it was slightly it was slightly turned up ever so slightly because of this was brand new, and we had to sort of like take take that and think right okay we've got to rely on these people to to go and and work remotely and and work on their own and uh, and figure these things out for themselves slightly, um, but at the same time as that they aren't alone they, there is Slack and there is uh, Zoom and they can at the drop of a hat. Uh, you know, hey, do you want to just do a quick call? Let's let's just figure this thing out, and then we'll remote into each other's desks, desktops, and and take over the mouse and just go. No, it's just there. Don't worry about it. And so um, things like that, where we felt like we could easily sort of like chip in and help them. But it's it's also interesting as well. It's because of like um, I've, I've come off my career. I've I've been a freelancer for quite a long time as well. So I always knew that this was possible for a lot of big studios, and usually it was the little studios that were more. Um, prone to, to to go for these sort of like things and, and saying okay we can possibly do this and now I think it's it's kind of opened up the conversation even further where you feel like actually we can hire somebody that's that's just going to stay in France and it's and it's absolutely fine because they're very talented they're very self motivated they're going to get the work done we can see it all going through on F track you know it's all up onto direct review and we we can review it all timely and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been it's been absolutely brilliant using uh, the the tools to actually um, make sure it feels like everything's just going through easily. Awesome. I, for those of you on the panel who are directly hiring people or reviewing applications or reels, it might be all of you. What what advice would you give a graduate who's applying for a job during this pandemic? Maybe some very practical things they should do that they might have had to do differently than normal or is it actually the same process um anyone want to weigh in with some of that sort of practical advice francesca i can i can start it's like i i've been hiring until i mean i'm currently still hiring uh, practically but i think like i'm a bit off at the moment and probably i'll start again in a week or so. Um, first advice, and this is for lighting and compositing specifically. So uh, Bluzu is hiring normally, it's looking for, basically it's looking for uh, people that do both lighting and compositing, which is a bit more rare, I think, in the industry. And I think well, the first advice is like, read the job application 
and actually uh, apply for the right job. <laughs> it's uh, part of my job is really filtering. The, the first part is filtering people that apply with only a compositing uh, show reel, only uh, or maybe an animation um, reel. It isn't like so. Basically, like read carefully uh, the application. Uh, the other thing is like I think if you we're doing like a um, university of studies, like thinking, okay, I'll do this and I'll come out with something um, in half a day for the showreel and then apply. It's getting more hard because, because now I'm considering people from everywhere. Basically like uh, I found um, the competition is not any longer uh, with people in Europe, but it's also from people from America, um, elsewhere. Uh, but for instance, I found that for lighting and compositing, um, lighting specifically, uh, there are not so many schools that teach uh, lighting uh, for full CG, for animation, which means that um, sometimes I see, I look at showreel from America and uh, they're much more spot on. Uh, now, as John was saying, there's a limitation, there's, there, there are limitations, there's also technical limitation to hiring someone from America, so uh, there's also something um, to think about the, uh, for what regards like the connection, the internet connection, uh, there is an, a general talk about the latency of the, uh, of the internet, which could make uh, really difficult to work for such a, a far away um, place but um, yes there's much more competition uh, so I, I think like you really need to even have a couple of pieces um, on your showreel but really polished really good uh, to a good standard. Awesome thank you anyone else want to weigh in with some practical advice for someone applying in the pandemic? John? Yeah so I just think think about people think about how I know it sounds really boring but actually how they're going to get paid um, because if you're going to hire somebody from overseas, you know, how are we actually going to pay them now that they are overseas in their bank account of their particular choice? So funny enough, a lot of people that we, you know, some of the people we've hired, you know, remotes have got obviously digital accounts that can work in different currencies without the commission charging. Just, just think about how you're going to organize yourself as a person getting paid by somebody from, arguably in our case, the UK. Uh, and also bear in mind that we are going to pay people in our local currency um, and not going to sort of, and going to pay the same regardless of where, where they are. So you have to take currency fluctuations into account. And obviously the UK isn't ideal right now for some of that, but um, you know, it may not be in the future. We'll see what happens, but you know, you've got to bear that in mind. If you're going to work, you know, you're not going to be in the UK working for a UK company, you're going to be paid in pounds, but to your local currency. And then it may be a slight difference. So, there are there are going to be practical financial considerations you've got to bear in mind or how you're going to apply to people and also i think that we as a company have to be more explicit i mean we are very explicit anyway by saying hey we can't take people from outside the eu area because you can't move here that's going to obviously be more important in the future but even then as i said before with the national funding we're going to have to take people who are within certain nation borders or regional borders perhaps or give priority to people there as well Maybe, you know we have to show our best efforts to hire people locally um, and i think it's going to become even more important now so you know when you're applying for a job not only is it up to us to make sure that we inform you but you must make sure that you're not annoying the company by applying for a job you can't possibly have in the first place um, we get a lot of people just just basically almost spamming us with with CVs for jobs that are not appropriate and it just takes a lot of our time and in the end we just dismiss them straight away it's brutal but it's what I say to students I say look you know we get hundreds of applications for every job role that we put out there we very quickly dismiss people you know we're not there looking at every show we are nitpicking it we are if, if there's a reason for us not to hire somebody we will dismiss it quite quickly because we we've got time in the day we're gonna we have to may only maybe look at 10 a day and we've got hundreds to get through. It might take us two weeks to get through all the applications. So we have to find a way of sifting through them quickly. Make sure that you are, you know, applying for the right job in the right place at the right time. Uh, and make sure that it's the best showreel you can. And if you don't have that stuff in your showreel, there's no excuse not to learn. Absolutely none. You get all the softwares out there. It's available. Teaching is out there. 20 years ago, I had to learn everything from a manual. Now, YouTube has everything. There's no excuse not to teach yourself something if you're applying for that job. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, agree, I agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, one of my biggest bugbears, though, is, is, is the credits not on a showreel. So you get a showreel and you're like, wow, that's amazing. 
well, what did they do? <laughs> you know, they, you, know they, you just don't know. Um, so that's one of the biggest bugbears. So then you've got to go and contact and go, can you tell me what bits are yours? Um, and yeah, like John says, we just get hundreds as well. I think the last, the last 3D artist position we had, I think we had 150, 200 applicants. Uh, and it's just the time to go through it. So, you know, the number of times people have spelled my name wrong and I've been called Emily, you know, hundreds of times. Um, things like that, just little things that you just, you know, you, you, you're trying to whittle these people down into, you know, so you, you've got a manageable amount. So if, if the showreel is not very good or if the, you know, the way they've applied is not very good or like John says, they're in a, you know, a remote part of the world, then those are things, you, you know, that will get you off the list very quickly. So yeah, it's, um, for us, it's key to have that amazing portfolio is the thing we look at first. So if it's a 3D artist, you know, what kind of still images have they done? What's the, the quality like in terms of output? Uh, and again, then for show reels, you know, if it's, if it's, it needs to be fully credited. So we know, you know, who they've done it for and what parts that they, they've actually done in that show reel. So those are the key things for us. Awesome. Janine or Chris, do you have anything to add to how yeah. to apply at the moment? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these, th these things applied before the pandemic. And then that's the key is that not a great amount has changed. It's like, make sure you're presenting yourself well to the company, make sure that your showreel is on point for the position you're going for and making sure that you, you know, you're presenting yourself and being enthusiastic about the post without sort of like giving us a full essay that we need to read before we get through to it. Because if there is only so many hours in the day to go through these processes. And when, when you set it up and you do have like a hundred to go through, you'll find the smallest little thing. And it is, it's a horrible way of doing it, but at the same time, you've got to be kind of realistic. Um, you know, once you get past that stage and you've seen and uh, you've got a lovely show reel and, and we, we sort of like made contact and stuff and we do the interview, it's then about your enthusiasm, I guess, more than anything else. And making sure that people feel that uh, make sure that we get the sense of enthusiasm for the project as well. Awesome. Well, I think we're running pretty close to the end of the chat today, guys. And I've had a really awesome time listening in and asking a few questions. I have to say the one big disappointment is that we didn't have any major BBC interruptions, children mm -hmm. coming in. Chris, I think you might've been the closest with some, people in the background but you know i had a few people wandering by i was trying to stay focused to keep looking at the screen <laughs> <laughs> yeah well thanks for trying <laughs> <laughs> look um I, I think i'll wrap it up thanks everyone for uh, attending um you know coming and sticking around it was really great to get your questions um thanks also to all the panelists um if you'd like to learn a little bit more about remote workflows at ftrack then you can sign up for the next ftrack webinar which is called review workflows with ftrack um, the ftrack remote review team will uncover the video review and approval solutions they offer and how each is tailored to benefit unique creative projects uh, this is taking place next tuesday september 1st at 4 p.m pacific time which is actually midnight in the uk so um I'm sure there'll be many people there. <laughs> um, there'll also be an introduction to actions in F-Track Studio on September 29th, and where you can learn how to extend and customize F-Track Studio. And if you'd like to learn about more upcoming webinars at F-Track, head to ftrack.com webinars, uh, slash webinars, sorry, where you can see what's on next and also learn about past webinars, as well as download previous webinars. Um, this discussion today is actually going to be put up there if you'd like to download and check it out. So once again, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, that 90 minutes flew by for me. Um, and I really want to say thanks again to the panelists and everyone attending. Uh, thanks very much, guys. All the best. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Bye. And take Cheers. Care thank you. Bye now. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.